Hello and welcome to the Villa Park Podcast. It's me, Rich, and I'm back after a couple of weeks uh, of off from talking tactics. And also, we wanted to get this out earlier this week, but uh, man flu struck me down, so we couldn't uh, do it. But we 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 couldn't miss out on basking in the glory of uh, Arsenal nil. Ast- and Villa too, and uh, to get the top man to analyse that victory, we had to get Gareth on the pod. So, Gareth, how are you doing first, mate? And uh, what a win it was on Sunday. Yeah, not too bad, thanks. Mate. Yeah, it was, wasn't it? It was quite unexpected in a lot of aspects. I don't think anybody really thought we could go. I thought we could go there and do something, but I'm not sure whether they thought we could come away with, come away with the three points. But yeah, fantastic performance. Tactically brilliant. Yes, yes. And then this is... This is why we get you on to talk about the tactics because, you know, a lot of us could kind of see as the game went on, you know, the Villa's ability, confidence, Arsenal's frustration, Arsenal's kind of inability to break us down was was evident for all to see. And um, yeah, we'll obviously delve into that further. But it, it was one of those games where you saw Villa just grow as the game went on and, and Arsenal kind of, you know, declined as the game went on? Yeah, I think it was a combination of us being really brave and courageous on the ball and really organised out of possession. But also you get these results this type of season. Last season, Arsenal fouled against Southampton at the same point. And it's kind yes. of, kind of feel that pressure in the stadium. Players feel that. And you would know that that is something we're not scoring. We're not. If it was an early goal, like the comment, like the level, if it was a, an early goal, I think for Arsenal, I think it might have been a different story. We don't know, but it might have been a different story. The confidence in the ground would have got them to kick on. They might have scored the second goal in the second half and you, and you finished the game 2 0. But they didn't do that. And as the game wore on, the stadium grew more nervous. The players grew more nervous. You could see Arteta on the touch on very frantic. You just got the sense that something was there for us. Yes, yeah, and it sure was, sure was. So look at the usual um, graphics and we'll go into our passing networks. Um, anything standing out to you here? You know, obviously we've got the usual Martinez to Power and, you know, Martinez to Carlos, uh, but anything else standing out to you at all? Not passing-wise particularly. I think uh, Powell was the, the highest combination was Powell to Martinez and Martin Powell was the highest volume of passer in the game along, and, then, and then Carlos alongside him. So, yeah, it was typical. It was just a case to build from the back and you could see how that's being brave on the ball, keeping hold of that ball. Don't worry about the Arsenal press, which wasn't at its best, I have to say. You know, I thought that if they'd have pressed us a bit more intensely, it might have caused us a few more problems, but they didn't, you know, not as intensely as they have anyway. But... I think it's just a case of being organised, you know, and we can see we're going to talk about Zaniolo and, and the midfield and everything in a bit. But the organisation and the tweak of Zaniolo at half time was really, really important. And I think Morgan Rogers played a vital role in this. I think it was it was a 4-4-2, but 4-2-3-1. We can argue all day long. I think it was a bit different in and out. 4-2-3-1 in possession and a bit of a 4-4-1-1, 4-4-2 out of possession. So I think Rogers just sitting in front of McGinn and Tielemans at times was a, was a really vital sort of thing thing that happened. Yeah, just one more little thing on this. And I think you could see when, particularly in some of the attacking moves that we had and lots of kind of things of uh, focused on it. But looking at these, I know it's like low, pa- fairly low in terms of the passing combinations, but they were really effective, like the little passing moves between Tielemans and McGinn or Carlos into Tielemans or Power into Tielemans, like those threatening passes or those kind of penetrating passes really worked well. Yeah, it, it, like I say, I'll go back to it. Uh, the sense that I got when we watched, when I was watching it is how brave we were and how courageous we were on the ball. And I'm repeating myself, but to have that intensity, to be able to do that away at Arsenal in, you know, in a cauldron of atmosphere, if you like, under pressure, knowing what's going to happen, they almost sort of played on the fact that Arsenal needed the ball to score. I know that sounds really strange, but they sort of they sort of almost took the mickey with them a little bit and passing it around. You're not having that. You're not having that. We're going to be brave. We're going to pass it through midfield. We're going to keep hold of the ball as much as we can. And I think that was the highest possession that an away team has had at the Emirates all season long. That's incredible. Mm. Yeah. Quick look at the uh, expected threat in terms of those contributions for passes and, and the set pieces. So, you know, quite Arsenal dominated there. Uh, Luca Dean not until, what's that, fifth or sixth in the, in, the, um, in the tables. But is that, I guess, is that more in terms of set pieces or is that looking at the first half? You know, there was quite a few threatening, threatening passes that, that Arsenal were making at times. 
Yeah, I don't. I think most of Dean is. I don't know if he did. He take us? Did he take any calls? I can't remember now, but I'm not sure. I but guess I Dean is from the cross, maybe that. But yeah, I think a lot of it was. I mean, it's not a high XT number one six, and the three two for Saka is not a great high number. But that, that sort of shows how limiting they were in attacking. How Saka was limited in attacking phases of play. But Luca Dina again, like you said, the top Aston Villa player there, and we've seen it time and time again. You know, he's really starting to sort of be a, a be a be a vital element of attack, especially in attack. I think. Yeah, he was he was excellent. He was excellent all game. Um, then in, in terms of the locations, um, you know, quite heavy for Arsenal down that their right hand side is that, that that's more more Saka area. Um and Villa, you know, not a huge amount there, but as we say, you know, the key moments were were where we <laughs> you know, where we made it tell. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the bunch the bunch all there is pretty much Saka and Ben White sort of combining down that right hand side and Odegaard, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But yeah, not much to look at from a villa perspective, I'm afraid. But you know. Some of those passes, I think that middle one sort of to the left is the through, but to the right, sorry, is the through ball for Bailey. So, yeah, interesting. Not much there, but, you know, stats don't tell the whole story, do they? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And I think, to be honest, like you said before, there's not a huge amount with Arsenal there. So, we did, like you said, we did kind of, we played it across the back really well. We almost tired them out, almost the, the, the kind of, you know, the space is then opened up later on because they do play that high press and, you know, they weren't able to have the threat that they did maybe possess, you know, as the game went on. So, yeah, it, it was really good tactics. Um, quick look at the XG. Um, yeah, anything anything that this is telling us at all, um, Gareth? No, I mean, you know, I think it's very reflective of the game that we saw. <laughs> Excuse me, a lot of blocks... So the, the three excellent saves from Emmy Martinez, you can see they're in close in close proximity to him, and a lot of misses from Arsenal. You know, a lot of you can see all the misses there, and quite a few blocks that were going on. So that sort of the Arsenal sort of shot map almost tells the Villa story for us almost because of the the blocks, the defensive activity going on there, and the XG was a little bit higher than that. That's under stats one. I think the XG for both teams was probably a bit higher than that. In all fairness. But I think it points more to the defensive side for Villa than it does an Arsenal side. Yeah, yeah, we definitely frustrated them. Definitely got tackles in before they were able to, you know, carve open a really, really, really guilt edge chance. And the timeline, you know, a lot of Arsenal fans or Mikel Arteta was, and it should have been three or four nil up at half time and what have you. I think you kind of bit back a little bit about that. But yeah, what was your what was your take on kind of the XG timeline? Yeah. Yeah, I did bite back a little bit when somebody put because I think I don't think that was fair. I don't think you can see that Arsenal created quite a few chances maybe in the first half. But what he said was was that they could have been more than three nil up and four nil up at half time, as you say. No, there was no way there was four. Chances. We can see in the whole game one point nine x. Even if there was two point five, he's not got two point. He's not going to be two goals ahead. I know it's just xG, but you're not going to be more than two goals up at half time. And I don't think anybody, even an Arsenal fan, should should would be saying. Oh, I think we should have been three or four nil up at half time. The XG timeline, which I posted, proves that almost from the shot count. Yeah, all right, there has a couple of chances, but nothing of really of any of any sort of of any worth, if you like. No, no, just the save that Martinez made, and I yeah. think Jesus had a header that went wide. But yeah, I mean, you you, you see those miss quite a lot. But anyway, Listen, I, it think, was I, tough I think if, I think yeah. if we'd have gone in one nil down at half time, we wouldn't have complained. No. But, you know, Watkins had the chance that hits the inside of the post. You know, it's, yeah, you know, I think, like I say, it's one of those where you're trying to paint a picture um, that, that maybe isn't always as the case may be. Um, guys, I did forget at the start of the show to say hit that like button and hit that subscribe button. Um, as It really does support the channel. Gareth puts a lot of time into this show as well. So it'd be a massive appreciation to like, subscribe, and uh, get your comments in as well. You know, I know it's a couple of days after the victory, but... We've got to bask in the glory. We've got to keep basking in the glory of it. Um, right. So let's have a look at kind of the analysis that um, that you've done, mate, because you've done some brilliant stuff, um, as always. Um, so just talking on, um, we've got a few few things to go through. Um, first one, kind of, the, that you touched on the formation. It's in the 4-4-2 um, defensive shape. So, yeah, talk us through how this kind of helped us. 
Yeah, I always like to go through the shapes and analyse because I like to see where players are in in, in sort of out of out of position and in position shape. And we set up in a four four two. It was more a four four one one with Watkins ahead of Rogers and Rogers just sitting in front of sort of McGinn and Tielemans, a half diamond, if you like. And I think that was the that was the way to go. I think because they were concerned more about Declan Rice getting on the ball and playing passes into these sorts of areas where Odegaard's on the ball there here. And this was the this was the vital. This is what Arsenal like to do. Odegaard in this area, maybe out to Ben White or straight through the lines into Saka. Now, Arsenal didn't make barely any runs in behind, so we were all good with that. We didn't play a high line. We just tended to drop off, so that was fine. And it was just a case of managing Saka. It's What it ended up boiling down to was just, can we manage Bakayo Saka well enough? We did it fantastically. And I think this is, then, this is in the first half quite early on, so... Zaniolo out on this left-hand side. I think a surprise inclusion, I think, to say. I think people might yeah. not have seen him in the side. But for there must have been a reason that he was included. And it was, it turned out that he's been training really well and he's been playing well. And something changed in memory, he said. And, and that's fair, because I think we've seen that in the last few games. Something has clicked with him. And we've often been quite critical of him on that's here, right. haven't we? We have, we have. But Emery, I called it on the other night and I said, like Emery has actually said, you know, since January he's kind of switched and he's really, really changed. And, you know, these players, Zaniolo, Rogers, you know, one or two of the other fringe players or so-called fringe players are making a real, can make a real difference. Um, what What's slightly different here in terms of the defence chat, obviously, is that more cut sign of Zaniolo pushing on a little bit more to press Ben White? What's your, what else you noticed about this defensive yeah, shape? Moving yeah, on a little kind of, bit. I'm kind of splitting airs a little bit here, but I wanted to just to sort of to, to highlight this when we've pushed up that little bit more. Saka, again, the highlight on this right-hand side, but he's covered off by Dina. So Zaniolo, in my mind, is probably being told, you can push on a little bit. Just push him up a little bit. Make them play that pass across the pitch. We're covered. We covered across the pitch and it was the same almost throughout the game. We didn't look like we were getting pulled about out of shape. It was a case of, look at Odegaard there, making that little run in behind Watkins to try and receive that ball in that space that I talked about in the previous slide. But look, it's covered. Yuri Tielemans has got that run. Yeah. He's seen him coming. If need be, McGinn can shift across and cover the other midfielder. And have Havertz, I think it was. And Havertz was a bit of a problem for Villa. He started to become a bit of a problem in the game, picking up the ball in wrong it. But we sort of, again, we sort of managed to have it covered a little bit. Yeah, I like um, I like Dina's uh, body position here because obviously he's got Saka in his eye, eye uh, vision, but he's also kind of covering this area here. Power can get across here. And then... I thought Diaby, like, while he wasn't great, sometimes his decision-making on the ball, I thought he did quite a diff good defensive job and then allowed, you know, because he's got that pace, because he's got that trickery as well going forward, when you're bringing on um, Leon Bailey with half an hour to go, that, that defender's thinking, oh, bloody hell, I've just coped with Diaby. Now I've got Leon Bailey coming on and that's where the that substitution can have a real impact. Yeah, I think, I think, it probably my guess would be in the team meeting that they spent the majority of team meetings talking about out of possession shape. That's yes. what it seemed to me because it seemed like we were a lot better out of possession than we were in possession. Yes, we scored the two goals. I, I grant you that. But and we were good on the ball. I'm not saying we weren't, but you could see there was a lot of work in it. I mean, oh yeah, against, yeah. Against sort of man against Manchester City, for example, Luca Dino and Paul Torres wouldn't have that gap. They but they were yeah. they were willing to do that. Yeah. No. No. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Um, yeah, so you mentioned Zaniolo and he, he was markedly different in the second half um, in terms of like his impact and what he did, which is great for him. But there was a tactical tweak that you noticed. Yeah, again, slightly splitting hairs. Maybe people will say, well, in the previous slide, we saw him on the halfway line doing that. Yes, we did. But we didn't see him. He was more in this position, as we can see, in a defensive shape. A lot more. I thought it was a game of two halves for Nick. I thought he was really sort of, it wasn't great in the first half. You could see he was kind of, what, what am I doing? What am I doing? Back to the old. But the second half, he was more organised. Once he And then once he regained the ball, I think this gave him the chance to sort of, if Sacco, if they could win the ball back in this area, he can then push on. He can really get a run on the ball. And I think that's where he's at his best, is when he's got the ball at his feet and he's able, he's able to run into space with it. I think that was the thing. And yeah, I noticed this a lot. He spent a lot of time in this sort of left wing back position, if you like. And I think that helped Dina because he could come inside. You've got a two on one on Saka there because Ben White didn't really tend to overlap or go forward that much. And I think yeah. they just tried to be, they tried to shore it up a little bit. 
Yeah, Zan- Zaniolo in full flight is uh, is very, very hard to knock off the ball. And you just said there, like in the transitions, um, he, he definitely pinned Ben White and, you know, he didn't really know how to handle him at times. No, they did this a lot, Villa. Once once the ball had gone forward, they then put sort of Diaby up as really quickly as they possibly could on the right and Zaniolo up on the left. So you've almost got like a front three. So you've almost got a spare man in Saliba or Gabriel, whichever he chooses to do. But they don't want to see this. Even a three on four, they don't want to see this. And then you've got Rogers backing it up from behind. And this, you know, this was fantastic. This is what I mean. The position that he was able to take up with Dina, if they won the ball back, he was then able to go. And he was straight one on one with Ben White. And I think that's what Villa tried to do. Yeah, no, it was it was not it was so dip noticeable because when you're keeping the ball in those areas and even if you're just passing it back, you're just keeping possession and looking after the ball, and it just allows you to be more confident in, in in making runs so it was it was massive for us the bravery you've touched on the bravery and being aggressive in possession so yeah and, and i know kind of that was some of the some of the points that they made on match of the day some of the points they made on monday night football but it can't go unnoticed no i mean a lot of teams do this a three two five in position so you have your three center acts you have your two midfielders and you spread your five attacking players across that back line you're almost looking at an overload here it's the same. It's free. It's five v five. But if you push one of those midfielders on in, in McGinn and Tillman's, you've got yourself an overload. And I think this was where it was really important. Look where Bakayo Saka is here. Now, how often do we see Bakayo Saka inside his own half having to do as much defending as what he did? And I think this is where Luca Dina again and Zaniolo really did sort of work well in tandem together, not just on the ball, but positionally, knowing where they are, knowing where that line is and being able to sort of break through that. And you've got multiple options on the ball here. And if we move it on to the next slide, Rich, we'll see where we want to get Pau Torres in the second half. Yeah. And there we go. And this is where you really want to get him on because look at where Saka is again now. He's on the edge of his own box. So you're giving him decisions to make defensively. And look at Ben White. He's not sure. What do I do? Am I going out to Zaniolo? Am I going to hold my, my... He should be in that back four, but he's not. He's worried about where Zaniolo is going. And this is where you need to get Pau Torres. And we've seen it. How effective has he been in these positions? Getting yeah. past him and everything else. It's fantastic. And Odegaard, again, having to do a lot of defending. I've got to go and press a centre half now. It's massive. He, he tends as well, Pau, to just hold on to the ball just that little split second longer to just to wait until something else might open up in the space and then he's got the ability to, to pick it out. It's like, it's almost the point of like, is he holding on to the ball for too long? But then he'll find this pass that maybe no one else could could maybe see. Yeah, I mean, listen, this is this is what he says about being brave on the ball. Some of these passes are not going to come off and Rayo's going to come out of his, off his line and probably take that pass if it goes in there. But, you know, the, the, the important thing is he was, it was almost like there was a focus on Zaniolo in behind. It wasn't so much focused on, on Diaby or Watkins so much, although Watkins did, did a bit like that, admittedly. But Zaniolo and, and Luca Din were really key on this left-hand side. And I think the best form of defence is attack. And I think to stop, yeah. Saka, to stop Saka coming forward so much, we're going to try and pin him back a bit more. Yeah, no, it was it was really good. It was really good. And yeah, you did, again, you touched on, uh, again, Luca Dean. Uh, he had a really, really effective game. You know, he, he he really did well against Saka. But then not only that, you know, you've just said they forced him back and, ultimately got the assist for the for the key goal, the, the one nil goal. And yeah, had a great game. Yeah, and this is the thing. I mean, you know, to be brave and again, push Saka, engage him high up near his own box. Don't let him turn and run at you. Again, engage him really high. And I think, again, he's, he's brave in a different way off the ball. You're just trying to be more aggressive and you're trying to win the ball back. Because if you win it high here, look at that. I mean, you know, you, you're pretty much in business. And, and they did that on multiple occasions, Villa. But Again, to try and push him back towards his own goal is is different level of, of defensive activity for me. I think they they planned it really well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, it was. No one could really say it was a smash and grab. Um, you know, it was. It was the goals were scored at the key, you know, key moments. You know, bang bang, eighty fourth minute, eighty seventh minute. No time to respond. It was like I said. It was, I likened it to like a boxing match where the the the, the kind of favourite comes fr- comes out in the first two or three rounds and, and throws everything and then it's kind of even even there's a, maybe a counter punch like with Watkins hitting the post that maybe knocks the play, uh, the the um, boxer the favourite back and then as the as the go as the fight goes on just that 
you know the, the perceived underdog just comes through and then in the end the, the, the favourite's got no answer and it's just like bang bang done yeah I mean you know I thought of it as along the lines of sort of it's not a freak result in the in, in the respect of we beat them at home uh, at our place we beat Manchester City we've now beaten Arsenal away it's not like a Palace going to Man City and getting a fluke win is it it's more no. you can tell that it's organised it's been it's been done you know tactically it's fantastic and you can tell that it's just not one of those freak results because we've done it time and time again so it just shows you the level that he's at mm, yeah fantastic um just before we finish up, just a quick, obviously, we, we're talking big week. Another, you know, th- these are massive weeks for Aston Villa. So we've got Lille tomorrow as, as we're recording this on Wednesday morning. We've got Bournemouth coming up on Sunday afternoon. And I know we, it, it's all those cliches, but it's all immaterial. I know you can't take the win away from Villa. But if you then throw it away against Lille, you know, with the Conference Eagle, or get a disappointing result against Bournemouth, all that hard work is, you know, almost, almost um, for nothing. Yeah, I mean, he's on the bus on he's on the bus on the Sunday night looking at the Lille game. I would imagine, you know, yeah. what he's yeah. like. And yeah, and I think, yeah, I mean, it's the close proximity of the games, isn't it? It'd been it'd been probably been nice if Bournemouth was a Monday night football or something like that. You know, give him that extra day. But yeah, Lille is the big one. I think you know if you if you can, I think if you kick on through that. I think then you will kick on to Bournemouth. I think I think you know we should beat Bournemouth. Is that you know I think that's but you beat Arsenal away it doesn't mean <laughs> like you play. No, exactly. <laughs> and Emery said it. it himself. It's about the consistency. It's about the consistency. Like a lot of things came together in that performance, like tactically confidence, you know, finishing, all that kind of stuff came together. But that doesn't that doesn't happen all the time. It's you know, can you continue that consistent performance? And yes, we've done it so much this season, which is tremendous. But you know, we've just seen it there with Arsenal a little bit where the pressure gets. You know, can we embrace it and can we keep that level of consistency? That's the that's the question, isn't it? Yeah, especially when you're at this level and it, you know, Europa League and things like that. And I think, you know, with fifth place, is fifth place still the Champions League spot still looking like it's on? I think it is, isn't it? After you, no, because well, Dortmund, well, Dortmund, Dortmund won. won. Yeah, so we we need we need like West Ham to at least win their game, um, Liverpool to at least win their game. I guess even if they don't go through, and then we need like we need Arsenal to do us a favour really against Bayern Munich and yeah. knock them out. That's yeah, I mean, I think, I think we're relying, let's be honest, whatever happens, I think we're relying on Tottenham dropping points, aren't we? That's what we're yeah. essentially Look, Us winning in the remaining games and Tottenham dropping points, which I think they will. I think, you know, I think fourth, I think I think we should be all right. With the fixtures that Spurs have got, as long as we don't sort of slip on a banana, if you like, along the way, we should be all right. Mm, mm, well, look, it's going to be... It's going to be interesting. It's a huge week uh, for Villa. Gareth, thank you once again. Amazing, amazing analysis. Where can people find you? You can find me at Analytics GC on Twitter or X, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll put the link to your website as well. But yeah, obviously, I'm sure you got a great response to your last kind of analysis that you posted on, on X. So please do check out that. Um, guys, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. We're marching on to uh, 4K. We want to do that before the end of the season. So make sure you like and subscribe and get your comments in below. We'll be back for instant match reaction after the Lille match. Uh, also match preview for Bournemouth and anything else in between. So make sure you keep your eyes on the channel. Thank you for watching. And as always, remember, we all follow the Villa. Yeah.